we've got quite the episode for you today. Today I spoke with Davi, and let's get a quick introduction from him before we jump into the full conversation. My name is Davi Ottenheimer. I'm the Vice President of Trust and Digital Ethics at Inroads. I'd like to say that I'm a technologist who focuses on ethics, but really I've done security for about three decades. So in case this is your first time tuning in to the Are You a Robot series, I'd like to take this moment to explain a little bit about what we are doing and why. This is a series that aims to tackle some of the greatest challenges and questions that come up from AI and related technologies. The way that we're doing that is we're scouring the planet to find some of the best and brightest minds in their respective fields to come on here and talk with us about what exactly they see the current state of affairs as, if they feel there is any best practices that we can take away, if they would like to advertise any important topics that we should all be thinking about, and a lot more. So it doesn't stop here. In case you would like to continue these conversations or you want to find a group of like-minded individuals, we have a Slack community and I encourage you to jump into that if you at all resonate with anything we're talking about here. Let us know what you're working on, introduce yourself and say hi. You can find the link for that in the description below. Last but not least, I want to give a huge shout out to our sponsor, Ethics Grade, who is powering this whole series. They have been from the beginning. And if you don't know what Ethics Grade does, they're doing some phenomenal stuff around ESG ratings. For those of you that do not know what ESG ratings are, that's where you study the non-financial impact that a company has on society. So Ethics Grade is going out there and they're studying the non-financial impact that different companies have on society. And they're specifically looking at the AI programs that these companies have, the data protocols that they take, or the data governance strategies that these different companies take. And you can see all of that on their website, ethicsgrade.io, which you can find a link to in the description below. And so you can go and you can download some of these benchmarks, which it's really eye-opening when you see some of the companies and the grades they've gotten. There are some surprises for good and for bad. I'm going to let you go and figure out which ones surprise you the most by clicking the link below and going to ethicsgrade.io. For now, that is all. Let's jump into this conversation. Are you a robot? It is a pleasure to have you on here, Davi, and I think we should just jump right into the conversation because I am excited to talk to you. You are a prolific writer, and I've been reading a lot of your different blog posts. I want to talk about a few of them in this conversation, but let's start with the idea of we were promised a lot from the internet. And if someone from the 1950s were to hear that we could have any information that we wanted, more information than is held in their local library at any moment at their fingertips, that would be like heaven to most people if you ask them in the 1950s. But it seems that we did not go down that route. And we're now at a place where... Things that we were promised with the internet, we're starting to see it's not all hippies, tie-dye, and flowers. What happened? Well, there's a number of misconceptions in that, so I, I have to backtrack a little bit. First, that there's an overwhelming amount of information is something I commonly hear, and that's just, for me, that's a fallacy. There's always been overwhelming information since the beginning of mankind, of any kind of history. When you walk into a library, though, you're not overwhelmed. I mean, as a historian, a trained historian, we were told to go into a library and find a book and read it and analyze it and figure out if it's better than the book next to it. I suppose if you first go into a library and you've never seen one before, it's overwhelming. But the reality is we go in and we know how to find a book. We know or should know how to read a book and figure out what's right and wrong. So the Internet isn't overwhelming. And I, we haven't reached a place where we're overwhelmed by data by any stretch. I mean, another example is sailing. 
Today, sailing is trivial compared to the way it used to be. Imagine going onto a ship in the 1800s and trying to understand it. Super difficult. But today, to go onto a sailboat and try to understand it, super easy. So we've actually progressed. One of the reasons for this mistake is because there are two forms of thinking, and I find this across all forms of science. There's an easy routine, minimal judgment form of thinking. These are routines that we use to get through our daily lives. And there's an efficiency inherent to this, which is we do it because it works and it has worked in the past. And we continue doing it because why waste time thinking about it? It's like having a white shirt and black pants for every day of your life. Super simple. Makes it really easy to get dressed. On the other hand, we have this process of identifying things, evaluating them by storing them, really, and then adapting based on what we figure out. I call this ICEA, so ident identifying things, storing things, evaluating and adapting. You can't live in an ICEA world permanently because it's so expensive. You're constantly evaluating every action, every step. And I'm not the first person to think about this. I've just observed that it's prevalent in everything. So in the 1700s, philosophers talk about this split. Well, that's why I feel like people feel like they're overwhelmed. It's because they move abruptly from a routine to a analysis world. What was routine suddenly becomes forced upon them as something they have to think about. And that's overwhelming because they thought it was easy and it's now hard. So the internet didn't promise everybody an easy world. <laughs> it promised them access to information, which could lead to an easier world. And I feel like it has delivered on that. The real genesis of the internet was, if you think back to the actual history story, a person sitting at their desk has two machines. They work on one, they work on the other. And they think, this is ridiculous. Why can't I just work on one machine where I can connect things together? It's absolutely delivered on that. We are so connected <laughs> that we have so much information at our fingertips. I think it really has delivered a lot of the promise. The flip side is it's really hard to live in an ICA world and we're living in that world and we need routines. We need minimal judgment and we don't know who to turn to for that. And that's created a lot of chaos. So can we dive into that a little bit more? What do you feel is wrong with the internet today? Well, one of the biggest things I find that is wrong is that people who can be wrong are allowed to continue operating as though it doesn't matter. The lack of responsibility for being wrong, the freedom to be ignorant or freedom to be an idiot is such a shocking new world we live in. When I read texts from the end of World War II, the clarity of mind and the cogent analysis of what needs to be done, what is right and wrong, it's shocking. It's almost unrecognizable to what I read today from people that seems to just throw out concepts of wrong as though we should continue doing what's wrong regardless. And that's that's really backtracking. I mean, the internet allowing this sort of spread of wrong is negligent. Facebook, in a sense, is just a criminal organization. They just peddle, as a criminal organization, lots of crimes. So you have to ask, why do people wanna let a criminal continue committing crimes? What benefit? I mean, sometimes we do. There are definitely periods in history when we allow criminals to do crimes. But why? Why Facebook, with so much power, continue being a criminal organization committing crimes? Why doesn't the internet bring that in? That's a big question for me. I feel like you were talking to me right there with the low barrier of entry and anyone can has a voice on the internet now and they can say whatever they want, but I'm going to pretend like you weren't. <laughs> and I think that you mentioned something that has been toted as one of the best parts of the internet, right? That anyone now has a voice. And so when we look at it through your lens, what exactly needs to be done to bring up the bar, as you say, like not all of us are historians, but all of us have the power to start a blog and not all of us are so clear in our thinking, but we can just word vomit onto a blog and it may or may not get traction, right? So how do you see this or do you see the quality going up? Is the quality just going to stay as is? Like how, how if any, can this problem be fixed? Right. Right. So, I mean, this reminds me of the when I speak about World War II in particular, there's a report that comes to mind, um, the idea of the endless frontier, science, the endless frontier. There's a line in there where it says that ability and not the circumstance of fortune should determine who receives education in science. And this idea of ability or agility, I mean, yes, everyone gets a voice, but the question is, can we measure people based on their actual talent, their actual ability? 
as opposed to a patronage system which says, well, you went to Harvard, so you must be smart. We'll have to listen to you. Um, and the reason you went to Harvard is because your family gave money to Harvard, that sort of thing. I mean, these, these are concepts that should be clear to everyone. But b- behind that is the philosophical foundation of an inherited versus a controlled right. If you inherit a system of right and wrong, then you can be held to account. For example, if you have a teacher and you're the student, so you've inherited right wrong from this teacher, and the teacher tells you you're wrong, that's ultimately the system you live under. Many people think of this in very strange terms today where they think, well, if somebody has the ability to tell me what's right and wrong, I've lost all control. But that's not true. You're living in a system which allows you to do right things, and you can ultimately change those definitions in some ways if you have representative government. But they confuse it because they think of another world, which is controlled rights. And that's fascism. That's tyranny. That's dictatorship, where no matter what, you're always right. And so how do we get out of this world where anyone can get on the Internet and say anything? Well, we look at it as an inherited rights system. We decide, well, we measure that like scientific method or, you know, we use a peer based review or we use analysis by experts in the field. We use these measures we've used for centuries, if not millennia to evaluate the validity of information. And then people who are right rise up, who know who didn't have a voice at all before. They just wrote a blog post, boom, everybody looks at it and realizes this person's more right than ever. So that's no barrier to entry. That can be amazing. On the flip side, you have people who (laughs) perpetuate wrong and just keep going on and on and on and on. Everyone's like, this is wrong, this is wrong. And somehow they are allowed to continue having that voice because they have power and they have patronage. That's, I guess, what I'm talking about. So If we don't understand the difference between inherited and controlled, like if we don't understand the difference between the ERM and the ICEA, the easy routine minimal judgment activities and the ICEA activities, we're really going to be screwed because people confuse them and then they think they're in the other one when they're not. Life is not meant to be easy when you're in ICEA. It's actually very hard, but it's meant to be hard. And it's meant to use a system of inherited knowledge and rights and wrongs versus a controlled one. Science doesn't work if you control the outcomes to where they look good for yourself and only you. Can we talk about that a little bit more? This idea of having, taking what we're putting out on the internet in more of a way that science is put out? Yeah. If you look at Google, it's an interesting origin story for Google. They took basically what was Beowulf, which was an open source concept of using lots of cheap computers for massive supercompute called Beowulf because of the legend of one man having the power of 30 in his hand. Um, And it was huge cost savings to do things in this distributed cluster way. They took that plus peer review. So both of these were sort of academic exercises. So they basically replicated the university experience. It wasn't really science as much as the university experience of peer review and massive amounts of people working on problems together in a shared way. So that would be a low cost, socially conscious way of getting to higher ground. In other words, they prevent, they provided us a technological solution that replicated long-standing practices of finding truth, inexpensive ways to get to collective reasoning of to what's right and wrong. However, because they did it in a way that was controlled by a small group of people who had very particular interests, profit, namely, they did it to the wrong degree. They did it to the wrong end. And in fact, a lot of their ads were fraud. There was no proof that any of the advertising worked. It was just a lot of money flowing through their hands. And there was no actual measure of success that anybody held them up against. So at least in the peer review process, you would think within the peers, they would hold themselves accountable. There's a lot of fraud in the peer review process. It's not perfect. But you at least have a chance of saying, okay, this isn't working and here's the outliers. If you move that entire process into a private institution and have them just run it themselves and say, we're using this public method on the internet to decide through page ranking, which things are right, which things are wrong, it can easily go off the rails, and it did. And so you ended up with a ton of fraud within the system. So that's both how it can work and then how it can be abused to make things worse through automation. And do you feel like considering the current state of the world and the incentives for someone like Google, that this idea would even be a reality or even be thought about as using like i i think about how you mentioned yeah there's fraud but google's not going to say anything because a lot of money is coming in so if it's bringing in cash 
then what incentive do they have to make sure that things are correct? Right. No incentive at all. They've had, I've had the privilege of being in Silicon Valley for a long time of being inside Google over and over and over again. They often invite or used to invite me in all the time to speak to them about issues they were having. And what I saw year after year after year was a complete cognitive blindness about philosophy, political science, humanities, the realities of how the world works. They were just so blind to right and wrong. Such that I remember people telling me, for example, the PCI DSS standard says we have to stop doing this thing because it's wrong. That's an inherited right. You know, in order to process credit cards, you have to as ascribe to the laws of the card brands and the payment card industry. So they wanted me to come in and argue for them that the inherited rights were wrong and that they should be able to do whatever they want. Keep, keep doing things that were completely broken and wrong, um, even though everyone knew they were wrong because they, they saw there was money there to be made. They even framed it as we're going to save grandma this classic misogynist trope of, you know, technology doesn't work for old ladies. So we're saving the old ladies, which is even worse. So I didn't agree with that at all. I told them they were foolish and that they should ascribe to the standards. And this later, this was years and years, long, long time ago. I can't remember how long ago, but it was, years later they reversed when they finally realized that it was stupid to hold on to terrible practices. Another example of the sort of mistakes they would make though, is they would say, there's no reason for nations to exist because Google's so big and will lead to a post nation world that's just groups on the internet controlled by private companies. Well, this was before there were hacks in China and then they came to the State Department and the NSA and they said, please help. We need to ha have your help in order to solve these problems. There's no way we can do this without some nation state stepping in to fight with the other nation states. This sort of abject dismissal of a thing which has value because they don't think about it in deep terms leads them to a situation where they th reverse and they say, oh my God, help us, you know, help from the thing that they said didn't have any value. And so Google wasn't incentivized at all, really, to think about things in real terms or to do the right thing. As far as I could tell, their culture was, they told me it was entirely flat. Nobody was meant to have any levels, even though inherently any group of humans getting together is going to have levels built into it. And then besides being inherently flat in their minds, they refused to believe that there would be wrongs done. And that led to a huge amount of crime within Google itself. You know, more executives that were purged because of sexual harassment or crimes than I've ever seen in any organization, ever. So that's the kind of ignorance against harm and lack of responsibility I saw in the Google culture early on. So they used to invite you in, I imagine it was before they read your blog? <laughs> my blog's been around longer than, much longer than Google. But no, they, they invited me in sometimes because of my blog, believe it or not. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, speaking of your blog, let's talk about something that I was reading around there. And you mentioned this idea of the decentral decentralization of the internet. I think that has become very popular these days because of blockchain and cryptocurrencies, especially everyone jumping on that bandwagon. But there is a lot of potential in it. And I'd like to hear from you what you think about or what you mean when you talk about the decentralization of the internet. So decentralization is interesting because it can mean a lot of different things to different people, which is ironically a lot of what decentralization is about. You find often that people want to use decentralization for ways of avoiding inherited rights, avoiding responsibilities. So in a way it's, you know, can I get out from my parents and go live somewhere else is decentralization <laughs> for a lot of people. And that's not wrong. But I think a broader perspective on decentralization is really to understand that you have absolute and you have relative concepts. So time is an absolute concept. Gravity is an absolute concept. If you go to a different planet, you might have different gravity. If you go to a different time zone, you have a different zone of time that you live in. But you're still, in relative terms, ascribing to this absolute of time. Decentralization has a lot of the same attributes of, I want to have some things be absolute, like an identity but I want to be able to apply that identity in places where I have total control. So I may get a driver's license or a passport or some state level ID, but I want to use it in a database that nobody has access to except for myself, because it's not centralized in a way that I have to give it to you just because I have an identity assigned, assigned by you. I mean, Facebook in a sense is the most vertical because in order to live in the Facebook world, it's like going into an apartment complex where they say, if you move out, you can't talk to anybody else in this apartment complex ever again you're dead to us. So if you leave your family apartment behind because you leave the apartment complex, it's like you're cut off permanently. And that's the vertical centralized model that doesn't fit at all to the human condition, you know, or the way the internet 
technology should work. And there's so many reasons for this besides resilience and persistence. Like data disappears if it's centralized. This is counterintuitive for some people, but you get on Netflix thinking you're going to find the movie you want to see because it's so centralized. But in fact, it's the opposite. They decided that one wasn't profitable five years ago and got rid of it. And there's no other copies. So decentralization has a persistence to it that's very valuable. The resilience is, you know, like availability. Because you move data around in all these places, then blowing up one or two or three means it's still available from another one immediately. So it has the ability of being resilient in a way that's very useful in internet terms because dynamically routing around faults is something that keeps the internet viable. It doesn't just collapse when there's one fault somewhere. So these are concepts that are very useful in, in decentralization. But like I say, a lot of people use it for their own purposes. So they think of it as a way to get rich. <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. yeah, which is, I think, the main way that we hear it being used these days. And people talking about the future of decentralized internet. And so you said something really interesting a minute ago that was around data moving around and having this decentralized nature, which will create more resiliency. Uh, you also mentioned that the data can be put into a place and I can choose who can see it and who doesn't. For me, those two concepts didn't really make sense. Can you explain what that is a bit more? Sure. The consent piece is a very difficult one to really get one's head around because you're you're basically saying I can give you access to my data, but people think of it in terms of like a USB key or the computer or a, a web server, but really you should think about it in terms of yourself. You give access to yourself, your body, your voice, your space based on consent all the time. You know, who you allow into your personal circle versus your public circle. That's what people should start thinking about in terms of decentralization. Because when I express myself physically, it's just a shade different from expressing myself digitally. I have a digital body. I have a digital persona. And, you know, it's when you look at things like promiscuity as a concept, especially in American law and the idea of choice and consent, you know, children aren't even allowed to say that they consented to something, especially in terms of promiscuity. And so there's very strict laws around whether they were even allowed to do the thing that they're being accused of. There are books about this, actually, incidentally, uh, that are very interesting about women who were jailed because they were prostitutes and who come to realize that they were not really being given consent and control over their body. They were in a system that denied the thing to them and then accused them of giving things away that they didn't even realize that they were allowed to prevent people from taking. So that's much more of the idea of consent around data that I want people to understand. Like if I have a file, my blog, that I want to publish and give to people to read, that's very different than I have a file that nobody should ever read. It's my personal thoughts that I don't even know if they're true. I'm just putting things down on paper to see if they're true or not, just working through them or deepest, darkest secrets that I may destroy. That's the kind of thing about consent that has to be dynamic. In the world we're in today, oftentimes in centralization, you give access and it's gone forever in a way that you don't even know where it is. It has a life of its own separate from you. And so imagine having a digital twin, if you will, or other personas representing you that you can't go and say, hey, that's not me. That's not what I represent. That's not. So the right to be understood is really what consent is about, much more than the right to be deleted. It's the right to be understood in a way that you can present yourself and control your own persona in a way that people then have to uh, respect or treat you as you wish. You know, so we had uh, another guest on in the first season of Are You a Robot? And it was Robbie Stump. And he was talking about how his vision for the future, he thought it would be really cool if you could have some kind of like protective shield around your data and you were able to know exactly when and where and how every piece of data that you were giving out was being used and you could revoke those privileges. Uh, and then you also would know when you were interacting with some kind of program, it would tell you what data it was using off of you if you wanted to click through and figure out, okay, so is there an algorithm that is potentially manipulating my decisions here? If so, what data has that been trained on, et cetera, et cetera. And I wonder for you, like, do you foresee that as being possible in the future? Uh, the future's 
a long ways away, as we know. So anything <laughs> is possible then. But do you foresee that being a potential reality that we live in? Well, shameless plug. I mean, that's what we're working on. So, and it's, you know, it's an idea that's been around for a while. You said the guy's name is Robbie, so it can't be entirely wrong. Um, but the, the <laughs> I mean, it's Dobby instead of Robbie. But my, my point is that, you know, Tim Berners-Lee came out with this idea many, many years ago. And that's exactly it that the solid project is designed to give you this human centered data store, the pod personal data store within the, the socially linked data system solid. So, and the W3C has been working on the standard. So if it flies and we've already got it, you know, as a product that we're releasing and people are using it. So it's, it's here and now, and you can actually start playing with it, you know, as a developer. So if it flies, yeah, you absolutely will be able to have your data store which could be multiple pods. It doesn't have to be an individual one. And then you can have multiple identities. And then you can see very quick, quickly, like who is accessing your data, turn them off. You can see who has access to what they're doing with the data. You can restrict things to very, you know, time-based or sensitive-based information. So for example, I need a ticket to a concert. So they need certain things from you. You give it to them for that one ticket for that one concert and they don't see anything else. Or I'm moving. So people need to see my updated data very different than trying to go out to all the databases and try to find all the places that your data is wrong and correct it. You know, I just got billed for 911 services in a city I haven't lived in for 12 months. And I figured this out on my phone bill and they credited me back. And I was like, Hey, I don't mind paying for 911 emergency in a place I don't live. It's kind of like a charity or like a contribution, but it's just weird. How did that happen? Like, how did they not get, how did they update my address, but not see that 911 was inconsistent with where I'm living? That kind of thing. So yeah, it's definitely here now. It's a reality. We have the capability, the technology exists, and we're building it out. So it's just a question now of adoption and whether the applications would be written to respect that and whether people would go along with it in a way that, that in my mind, it reduces litigation because you have to fight less in the courts. You can use technology more to arbitrate the dispute. Like this is, I have Providence. This is my data store. I am the official author of this information. I can prove that. Therefore, there should be no dis dispute. Versus now going out trying to figure out who has the information and finding class action to try to get it corrected, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, there's a lot of stuff up in the air as to how it will pan out, but I think it's already here and it's working. So I'm wondering about would it need to be this because you're talking about decentralization and the only way that I can foresee this in my limited scope of understanding is that it's, it's a central place with all of this data. And maybe the data isn't stored in one central place, but it's different uh, places that it's stored. But the the main person that has control of the data is me. But how do I interact with that data? And wouldn't that be from a centralized company or provider? Well, it could it, it very, very well could be. Think of it in terms of transportation, like you have the option of working on your own car, fixing it, repairing it, but you also can just give it to someone like you buy a Ford. Maybe you take it in your garage and you work on that Ford. Maybe you give it back to Ford and say, I don't like how this works. You fix it. So you can have it centrally managed, controlled and operated for you, but you still have some consent and decision around who works on it. That's very different than today where you have no choice. If you're on a system, they work on the system. You get to come into the system, like a high rise building, you get to step into it. It's their building, you're on it. They get to do what they want to it while you're there or a hotel. It's very different than home ownership where it's your plot of land and you can choose to have people who represent big services come on to your property and work on it in your terms, right? So it's, it's centralized in the sense that you have the option of putting it in a place where it is where you want it and people have to come to it, but you can also push it out to other places and have people go find it there too. That's just, just the, the idea of the consent being related to the choice is very different than having no choice and then being asked if you would consent. And really, because you have no choice, you have no choice. So you kind of have to consent and that's not consent at all. That's kind of what I'm saying is I, one question that comes up a lot is, you know, if I take all this data and I put it in one place, doesn't that make it more of a target? And the answer is, well, who better to protect something than the person who understands the risks? Think of it in reverse terms. If I spread all that data all over the place and I expect other people to prevent it from being attacked, what incentives do they have at all? They might actually have, they very often and actually might have the opposite, which is to let harm be done because it benefits them to no benefit of you at all. And when you say, are you protecting me? They say, we're trying. So sure, it can make you more of a target, but there's ways to deal with that, which are actually very effective. The alternative is actually very scary, which is to not have any control, any effective measures to protect yourself in the distributed format where 
it's been pushed out to other people that you can't control. That's the, the, the centralization that gets distributed in a way that you don't like. This is fascinating stuff we're talking about, and especially when it comes to what you were saying with consent as far as right now when we're on the internet and we are using whatever it may be, a uh, banking app or Facebook, we just go in and we say, yes, I agree to the terms because we need to use our banking app. Otherwise, we don't get our money. Or we need to go on to Facebook and send a message to a friend we haven't seen in 20 years or whatever. And so taking that back and giving the power to us is much different. But I still feel like the big things or the big companies such as Facebook or our banking app are going to be able to give us this, here's our terms and conditions. If you like them, great. You can use our product. If you don't, see you later. Yeah. I mean, you, you definitely see this over history many, many, many times. I'm a big fan student of history. So, you know, 1968 Carter phone case was seminal in creating the internet because here's a guy who said, I want to ride out onto my ranch with my horse and I want to be able to receive a phone call or even know that I get a phone call. And so he, Carter designed this thing that allowed him to do that. And the AT&T took him to court and said, you can't connect anything to our network. It's our network. And that was the genesis of our internet, internet today, that you can connect things to this network that are not officially owned by the company that runs it. Even today, if you go into old houses, you might find some things that say, do not tamper with inside your house. Do not touch, do not tamper. It's owned by the phone company in America, which is mind blowing for people who grew up today who think, what? I can plug whatever I want into this internet. <laughs> Any random garbage I buy off the internet, I can plug into the internet. But from there, you have to look at, you know, X25 as an example where IBM and AT&T said, if you want to be on the network, X25 is the network and we're going to own it and you're going to pay a premium to use it. Well, that gave way to TCP IP, which is completely open and doesn't have anybody owning it. And so all these devices were put onto the internet using TCP IP. So over and over again, through the history of how the internet's come to be, we see these companies come with the idea that we're going to have people do things our way because we own this space, whether it be Apple or Google or Facebook or Microsoft. And over time, they have to give and give and give until the natural course of history is to force them to let go. And most often they're making some pretty bad choices. X25 was a terrible protocol versus TCP IP, although I know people would argue that even till today. The advantages of TCP IP are that we got to the place we are today, which is better than if we would have been owned by an IBM network. Something like a Minitel in France, where the government and the corporations are in bed to like push out a centrally planned and controlled network. Very little innovation in that kind of space. Hmm. So yeah, I, I think you'll find over and over again, you know, the TV companies said, why would you use the internet? Why would you use a web browser, right? Cable companies famously thought the web browsers were stupid in the 90s, but everybody watches TV over the internet today, right? The cable companies lost that battle. They wanted to own the pipe all the way down to the, well, they even own the TV in some cases, own the device on top of the TV and control it. I worked with security people whose job was just preventing people <laughs> from getting free video through these devices because everything was so tightly controlled. And it's a losing proposition. They eventually had to give up when YouTube just blew them away. You can watch a video anytime. And I'm not saying I'm a proponent of either one. I'm just saying the natural course of history is this information wants to be free, information wants to be shared, and the open standards make it happen. So if you want to be on the right side of history, you tend to think about these things in those terms. And you realize that the private implementations of this have lots of advantages for a short time, but they're not the long term, not, not the long term bet, not at all. So let's talk about this article that I sent you. Uh few hours ago. And anyone who has spent time on your blog knows that you're not afraid of speaking out against big tech. And uh, you don't have or you don't see the CEOs of these big tech companies nor companies like Tesla in the greatest light, I can say. And so is there something that is because you've been in Silicon Valley for so long and you've seen things and then you have your historic vision that you're looking at what these companies are doing and you maybe see what they're doing and see how it's wrong and then you try and say something and nobody listens or it doesn't, these calls for help don't get heeded. And so then we just go down these crazy paths that we've gone down. 
Uh, do you feel that you're a bit jaded because you've been in Silicon Valley for so long? <laughs> well, that's a funny question because what about all the people that aren't jaded who have been here a long time? I think, I don't think it's that. I think I've always been jaded my entire life because I like history. And so that gives you a certain jade. I mean, you ultimately are condemned to seeing people repeat the mistakes of history to put a spin on a famous phrase. Mm -hmm. And, and that's really what it is about. I mean, if you study history, really study it and really get to know how technology has been used. And then you come into Silicon Valley as a technologist and just see people left and right repeating the mistakes. It's, <laughs> it's definitely jaded. Like Uber to me from the very, very Genesis was a garbage idea that ignored like 300 years of obvious history. And they just did everything wrong. Everything. Like the whole concept was wrong and the way they implemented it was wrong and everything. And the fact that people put money into the absolute wrong way to do things was just mind boggling. And so, of course, I was out there the whole time saying, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. It's just it's impossible for me not to say that. Um, not because I'm a truth seeker in, the, in, in that sense, but because I've read the history. And if you read about shared ride, whether it be Paris or London or New York, you know what the outcome of these decisions are. To their credit, when Uber finally killed a pedestrian and realized how far off they were, they shut the program down and they reevaluated and they started to ask some hard questions. I have not seen that in Tesla, which is another company that has not sort of the opposite. It was like right in its genesis, but then it got forcibly taken over by someone who wanted to drive it wrong, no pun intended. And so this person who took it over, who's now the CEO, has been doing the wrong thing. And so when they killed a pedestrian the same month, basically, as Uber, we see the opposite. Instead of shutting it down and doing the sole assessment, they started charging more money for this terrible technology that kills people and actually trying to promote it as though it's a feature that they can murder people. So it's hard not to be a critic of people making these really big, dumb mistakes. But being a critic is not in any sense powerful compared to money. You know, if I had a billion dollars, I would have far more say than if I had an idea that's right. <laughs> it's simple as that. And so I see a lot of that money coming in, just fueling these bad ideas and people getting rich off bad ideas. And that's a lot of times the way the market works when it's so unregulated and there's so little inherited right, wrong, you know, put to these people so that they can't just continually be making mistakes. But let me also say there's a lot of right in Silicon Valley and big tech. I mean, I work with a lot of people doing the right thing. That's basically what I do. People hire me to help them do the right thing. So I definitely have a lot of respect for certain leaders. You know, Craig Newmark, for example, Craigslist. I mean, what a phenomenal guy. Craig is not only genius in what he does, but he's such a humanitarian, always giving back. But the fact is, Craig Newmark doesn't show up in the news like an Elon Musk. He's doing all these right things all the time and all these great things that are helping so many people. He's helping people be fed. He's helping veterans. He's helping homeless. He's help and that just doesn't show up in the news. But Elon Musk creating a flamethrower that has no purpose except to break the law, that's all over the newspapers. So I'm a big fan of people, and I, I guess I could promote them more myself, and I try to, but ultimately I'm trying to stop the wrongs. Hmm. So I did a bit of a pump fake when I said we were going to talk about this article, and then I asked you that question. So <laughs> <laughs> I could talk, let me talk about the article. The bottom line of that article reminds me very much of the fact that what Zuckerberg is implementing is a cult. And so the like concept that he has, if you go back to the genesis of his whole company, is a woman turned, turned him down. He didn't appreciate not being liked inherently for who he is. So he created an engine to try to harm these women. And when women in Harvard called him out on it and said, you've created this horrible thing that's basically this toxic shame engine, that's, he said, oh, I didn't mean to be caught. I didn't expect anyone to actually see me doing this. I wanted the power without the responsibility. In fact, I believe he said, it's alleged, he said, responsibilities for losers. And so what he created essentially is like what you'd see if a cult was created, where everybody has to like the leader. And if you don't like the leader, you get pummeled out or you're forced to turn around and like the leader. And one of the key points for me was when he traveled around the country and people said, well, if Facebook worked. Why would you have to go in person to all these communities? Isn't the whole point that you can remotely be in part of a community? And then they thought maybe he's running for office, maybe he's politicking. But the subtext for me was in the newspaper articles that appeared in the towns he went to, which were written by religious leaders. And I kept seeing these articles that would say, dear CEO of Facebook, you're not going to replace our church with Facebook. And then it occurred to me that what he was trying to do was get into communities that were already led by someone else and replace their leader and get those followers to be his followers. So he very much is looking for a way to create a cult of followers that will just basically pay him money, give him power, give him likes, give him whatever he wants. And then he'll use that power however he wants, regardless of what other people want. 
And so when people talk about the metaverse or people talk about him trying to get people to a world where they can have everything they need, well, it's a cult. And he's trying to build a cult environment the same way any cult leader does so that he can be the ultimate leader without any question and no responsibility to anyone else. And that's a fantasy I saw, like I saw at Google, where people believe they could be above the law. And I see it at Facebook and I see it. I even see a lot of people I used to work with in big companies went to work at Facebook and I see them retiring on the wealth and thinking, well, at least I got rich. I don't have to worry about this anymore. <laughs> they very much don't think about how can I make the world a better place? They think, how can I do my job, get as much money as possible and then get away from all this stuff and live in this like isolated bubble, like a rocket ship that goes to Mars. And that's a terrible way to, again, they don't study humanities. They don't study giving back. They don't study like making the world a better place. They, they ultimately try to study how to get rich quick. Or die trying. Yeah. <laughs> nice reference there to 50. So yeah, along those lines of people that go there and they have this idea of, hey, let's just get rich. And then it's somebody else's problem. Like I do some harm while I'm there. And oh, maybe I don't realize the scope of the harm that I did. Like in the Netflix documentary that came out where all of the people are that created these like buttons or created the YouTube algorithms are now repenting and saying, oh, we didn't realize it was going to be so bad when we were working on it. And then you see that now they're trying to lead the charge as to how to make it better, which I find very interesting. And I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts on that. But going back to those people that you talked about, your coworkers, your past coworkers who go, they get rich working at one of these big tech companies and then they feel like they can go and be a recluse or they can live away from it and whatever happens there in Facebook or Google or wherever is not their responsibility. How, like I, I'm shocked by that because I know it's so true. I've seen it before and it's also, and it's almost like it's an inherent drive in the humankind like yes we want to go and get this money and then be free and live on a beach or whatever retire what is it about that why is it that we want to do that and then we're willing to put up with some of this horrible stuff that we see going on and we realize we're not working for a good company I don't know if anyone at Facebook really believes they're working for a good company. I would love to see a poll on that, but I really struggle to believe that people think that Facebook is out there to do good in the world, like they initially toted they were going to do. So what are the thoughts on that? I mean, I've written about some of this. So to, to begin with, you have this appropriation um, problem where, for example, you'll have black women who are standing up against injustice and then a white savior roll, rolls in and says, wait, is that injustice? And am I part of it? Okay, hold on, everybody, listen to me. I'm gonna talk about how I'm fighting injustice. And the people who actually live it and experience it and are fighting it the whole time are erased from the dialogue where this white male stands up and says, hey, everybody you should listen to black women. I always try to avoid being that person because I see people doing it all the time. And I, and I think it's better to say, hey, talk to those people. They're the ones who are fighting it from the beginning. And what I've written about it is essentially the same, that you have, People who go in saying, I didn't know that this was wrong. And they come out saying, now that I know it's wrong, I want to have a career based on the fact that I spent three years doing wrong. Now, Frank Abagnale is a good example of this, where he's very tightly restricted in what he can say by the law enforcement. He says a very you know, specific speech, and he talks about how he made life choices that were bad, and no one else should make those life choices. And he's allowed to only make so much money from it, apparently. you know, So it's very controlled how a criminal is allowed to use their criminality for profit, but that doesn't happen in tech. In fact, the opposite, people are allowed to do what Frank Abagnale did essentially was just go in and have a field day stealing and taking and you know raping and pillaging and doing whatever they want with people. And then they emerge out of it saying, whew, now I've got a talking circuit track that's gonna make me millions and I'm gonna be even richer because I'm gonna be on news every night as a celebrated lecturer. And that's, that's a huge problem. You know, that just people should be able to say, you are part of this regime Therefore, you participated, facilitated. You have to start from there. In other words, you have to wholly reject it, not just say, I was there and I did it and I'd like to continue profiting from it. You have to actually stand up against it and reject it wholeheartedly. And there's a lot of examples of this in history. You know, the way the Civil War ended, for example, the way people were reincorporated, the way Nazi Germany 
was ended and the way people were allowed to reincorporate or even brought into the United States into prestigious roles as Nazis. So, you know, it's not a clear cut case of you can't rehabilitate or can't profit from being a part of an evil regime, but it definitely needs to be explored in terms of have you rejected the thing wholesale? Have you, can you reject it? And can you be accountable in some way for those crimes? And that last piece is probably the most important. I, mean, I have not seen people be held accountable. Uh, in DC, I lobbied hard and actually went to bat to try to put some Facebook executives in jail and to hold them accountable for their crimes. And it was just amazing to me how some people wouldn't even talk about it. They were just afraid to even bring the subject up. Whereas other people were like, finally, someone who's willing to say this in DC, why doesn't anyone speak like this person? <laughs> I was like, because I'm not in DC, probably. I'm a, <laughs> I can talk like an outsider. So there's a lot of unsaid stuff that's going on and people aren't really standing up and doing the right thing for those who are profiting from their appropriation. Well, others are standing up from the beginning against these things and they're refusing to take the job, for example, or saying that they have to, if they're going to go in, it has to be on these terms and they will stand to those terms and then being fired for it as opposed to leaving graciously and saying, hello, I want to talk about why I left. So that's sort of a long answer to that short piece of, of the question. But but ultimately, I mean, I want to get back to the point that the, the wrong right of Silicon Valley is very interesting because people do not go into it studying wrong right. So many people are allowed to go into computer science without a basis of ethics, without a basis of knowing how to discern what is bad for the planet. And science fiction deals with this to some degree. I mean, there's snow crash, which people refer to all the time, but really they need to think about things like the three body problem, which is a Chinese book. And so I know many people are, nobody really reads this, but there's science fiction around the world that deals with, you know, what is a world of right wrong and how do we approach it in a way that we can get to a better side? So if we can use science fiction or if we can use some other literature, some way of getting to these people and saying, if you're going to write code, if you're going to create products, if even if it's just a button, on a, even if it's just the save icon on Microsoft Word that looks like a <laughs> thing that no one recognizes anymore, it's little t trivial decisions about this affect a lot of people. And if you're going to work on this stuff, you need to have a foundation in ethics. The same way that if you're going to make planes, you have to have a foundation in physics or you have to understand gravity. You shouldn't be allowed to make software unless you have a foundation in ethics understand the science of ethics. To me, gravity is like ethics. You know, Newton was a, stu a student and led the way in, in understanding gravity, whereas Hume was a student and led the way in understanding ethics. And it's like, to me, they're sort of similar. Yet when I teach ethics to computer science students, a lot of them get it, but there's always one person in every class, whether it be a corporation or whether it be an actual university, who says, if I make money, how could it be wrong? If people give me their money and I give them this product, that's it. That's the extent of my exchange with them. There's nothing else in my mind that I have to do or there's responsibility that goes beyond that. And so that's that's the bigger issue. That's the bigger problem in my mind is we're living in a world where if you're a chemical or a mechanical or a structural engineer or any kind of engineer, you have to take an oath of ethics and say that you, you abide by these principles that do no harm to society. But if you become a computer science engineer or try to study computers, you have no responsibilities. And in fact, a full 50% in some studies would say that it's outside their domain of expertise. And that's just crazy to me that it's almost a loophole where people can get rich by doing harm, by doing wrongs. And that to me is part of the explanation why a Facebook can even exist. You know, it's like they're building bridges that keep falling down and they get paid more and more and more for them. And they just think, well, why would we stop building bridges that fall down that we get rich from? We save so much money building them and we make so much money selling them and that's the problem. You know, we don't hold them to account for the fact that they're just full on killing people, which is not an exaggeration. I, I don't think it by any means. I think Facebook is trying to say, hey, we did some good over here or we've created a think tank over here that says we're doing good, even worse. Therefore, all the wrong we're doing should just be overlooked. And that's completely the wrong way to look at rights and wrongs. You're not allowed to do wrongs just because somewhere else you did a right. That's a horrible way to look at things. In some sense, that's exactly what Nazi Germany was doing, saying, well, we took these Aryans and we gave them a nice house. So does it really matter that we took the house from a Jew? It's like, yes, it matters. You did a wrong. Genocide matters. You can't just do that so that these people have some nice things done for them. Yeah, that's how bad it is. Wow. So just a quick question along the lines of what you were talking about before, when you give these classes and you have some of these computer scientists that are saying, well, if it's someone paying me, I'm creating value for them. 
that's the end of the road there. Is the argument there that they feel like they should be able to put up shop for whatever it is that they want? And if someone finds value in it and they're willing to pay for it, then there should not be any kind of regulation or or guardrails put around it? Yeah, it's basically if someone pays, it must be okay. And it's it's truly a sickening form of market commerce where they believe if they make money, then the market in itself is regulating because there wouldn't be money if it was wrong. And that's not at all how markets work. <laughs> I mean, you can get paid to do wrong all the time. So soldiers of fortunes are illegal for a reason. And it's, yeah, it's pretty sickening. And I've worked inside a lot of those environments and I've worked very, very hard to, to fight against it. And it's difficult because there are so many people who are allowed to create and lead and run these organizations that just make money, make wealth, and do not care about the harms they're causing to society at large. And it's partly a fact that uh, nothing is forcing them to care, right? There's no regulation at a level that would force them to innovate. I'm a big believer in regulation, forcing innovation. If you say we have to go to the moon, that's a form of regulation. I wouldn't go to the moon unless you said we had to go to the moon. So why would I innovate in that way unless you said so? And so to me, regulation is the purest form of innovation. And we need people to come in and say, do no wrong. Or if you do wrong, you'll be responsible. And that forces innovation. And then they start to do right because they have to do things in a way that doesn't get them into trouble or doesn't hold them responsible. And we don't see that. We don't see innovation in those terms. What we see is lack of innovation and just repeat harm. Like I said, Uber was repeating harms and making money at it. Terrible. They were filling up streets with cars, polluting more, causing more waste. Like literally Uber drivers had nowhere to go to the bathroom. An old problem solved in London a long time ago in the 1800s. So they're defecating all over the streets. It's They just created a huge amount of harm and made a lot of money doing it in the meantime. And that's just, it was so obvious to me that this was a for-profit harm scheme. That That's, that's ultimately what I see in a lot of these venture. Now, I think all of this can be avoided if you study a little history, you do a little political science, you study some philosophy, you have an ethics class, and ultimately you require people to have a foundation in these concepts before you apply them to technology. This makes you cognitive as opposed to a cog. So many people are willing to become a cog in the system because by being an important cog that's required to turn, then they think they're going to get paid a lot. Well, without me, this machine doesn't turn. I'm a cog. They have to pay me. Don't be a cog, be cognitive, where you understand the entire system. And do you want to be a cog in that system? Because it might be churning out terrible things and you don't want to be there. That's the cognitive, cognitive approach to problems that comes from social science, humanities research that's lacking in so much of the technology space. So getting back to the metaverse and that article that we were talking about before, and what Zuckerberg's vision for the next edition of Facebook and where basically he feels the online life is going to go. He mentions that it's it needs to be decentralized and Facebook's not going to own this whole second reality of whether it's virtual reality or augmented reality. They're just going to be a piece of the puzzle. And I'm wondering, all of these risks that you're talking about, they're easy for us to see now that it's happened and it's retroactively playing out. Do you foresee huge risks once we start spending more of our time on an alternate or a virtual reality plane? Well, yeah, yeah. There's more risks, of course. Well, let me just point out that I deleted my Facebook account in 2008 because it was obvious to me that it was a toxic and harmful platform. 2008. It's hard for me to even believe that 2008 was so long ago, but 2008 is when I deleted Facebook. 2016 is when I came out and said, look, Tesla is obviously a dumpster fire and this technology is garbage and it's going to cause a lot of deaths and harm. And Tesla's killed more people than the Pinto by far. I think they're in the hundreds now almost, in the 90s or hundreds. And the Pinto officially only killed 25 or 30 people. You know, it's four times as deadly as the, the Ford Pinto. So today, asking me, you know, is this going to be harmful? Let me tell you, my record has been pretty good in telling you what's going to be harmful. You know, swarm drones I was working on five years ago and are now all over the news. So, yes, it's going to be harmful in the sense that, again, you know, technology can be used for good or bad, for right or for wrong. And 
if we use, let me give you a good example. If we used virtual reality or metaverse as a history teaching tool, for example, if I walked into a street in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I saw that it was named after a Confederate general, and then I walked into a neighborhood and I saw all the streets were named after Confederate generals, the virtual reality could tell me, this is terrible. These are all people who were enslaving people and fighting for the expansion of slavery. And this neighborhood is essentially a perpetuation of the worst aspects of humanity. All these streets, all this history is something you should know because we're standing in is like, it'd be like going to Germany and walking down Hitler street and Rommel street and, you know, name. And so it can be very useful as a tool to give you a reality that you wouldn't see because it's hidden. But the flip side is because the powers that be, what are the likelihoods that that would actually happen? It can be used very much the opposite, which is what we're seeing play out in Texas. A lot of people forget that in 1835 in the United States, the gag rule was used to silence any discussion of abolition. Even fewer people probably know that Andrew Jackson used his postmaster general to inspect the U.S. mail and destroy any of it that, that talked about abolition. So complete absence of freedom of speech, so like destroying communication and preventing people from talking about it and preventing people from writing about it or sending things in the mail. That's what's happening in Texas right now is they're saying you're not allowed to talk about critical race theory because it's critical in a way we don't like. Whites can be critical of blacks, but blacks can't be critical of whites. And so if you get into a world like a metaverse or anything, even if they claim it to be distributed and you have not assessed the impact of these types of political battles, then you can very quickly end up on the wrong side where you're perpetuating the worst harms and giving the people in power the ability to continue pushing this cognitive narrative that's completely false and broken and, and, and toxic. You know, Texas was created as a state because of slavery, and it does everything in its power to hide the fact that its entire origin story was perpetuation expansion of slavery. Giving them virtual reality, of course they're going to use that to do the same thing, unless someone's able to step in and say, let's use this for good. And so that's the bottom line is, you know, if people aren't aware that this technology has the potential to do really, really horrible things much faster to more people earlier in life even, then it will be used for that. And the idea of distributed again, I mean, is a, it's almost like salt and pepper that people sprinkle onto their technology today. You know, it's a spice that in order to make it's like whether AI, ML, these are terms that people like to sprinkle in. Distributed doesn't necessarily mean it's better. For example, Facebook can say we've distributed clients and so it's all distributed, but it's still centralized in the concept of how it operates and functions. The data has to be centralized. You have to be on their platform. It's proprietary. You can't get out. The, the way that we measure decentralization has to be like standards based, open. People can leave. They have consent, they have control, it's human centric, right? It allows people to be able to move things in a way that they're not being told they can't by someone who has authority over them. That's the centralization aspect. And that's the classic, again, if you study political science going back hundreds of years, it's the classic federal versus state. You know, in some cases, the state or the municipality even needs to have some way of establishing a better way of doing things. But sometimes the federal government has to step in and the balance has to go back and forth. So centralized has some value, but decentralized has value. And so the ultimate solution is to have the flexibility to choose one that is most suited to your particular needs. It's the lock-in that is the most dangerous. And that's what we see in centralization is they tend to have lock-in because they wouldn't exist without the lock-in. And that's why it's so dangerous. Whereas decentralization doesn't necessarily have a lock-in to it because people, you know, don't feel like they have to be locked into decentralization in order to continue using it. <laughs> that's, that's basically the the important distinction between them. So there's one thing that Zuckerberg says in that article that really makes me think how these big tech companies, they come under a lot of scrutiny and they are pushing the envelope continuously. And you said something just a few minutes ago that is fascinating to me and it's regulation is the driver of innovation. And when we look back at these tech companies and Zuckerberg said what his, uh, let me see what, what he was talking about. He was saying that there are going to be more risks when something like a metaverse comes about and you potentially have People that, like in the article, they were talking about how if somebody's looking at the Capitol building, one person can be seeing that, yes, this is where Congress or this is where our our decisions are made for the country. 
And then another person can be seeing something that says, this is where lizard people are doing their fake work. And so you have these two totally different juxtapositions of, of uh, truths that some people believe, although one is not very true, as we both know. The, the thing that I'm wondering about is these tech companies, the gigantic tech companies, whether it's your Amazon, your Apple, your Google, or Facebook, that are trying to blaze the new paths and they're trying to do these new innovating things, they come under scrutiny. And is it not the nature of the beast when you're creating this new stuff that you're going to not be able to foresee everything? And so you're going to break a few things while you're at it. And uh, I, I almost like want to go take a shower now that I said that almost, almost paraphrasing Zuckerberg's, uh, you know, move fast and break things. But I, I really wonder any new technology out there, is it not going to not, it's really, I, I'm not sure if I'm phrasing this correctly, but the main thing that I'm wondering is when new technology comes out, is it not the nature of the beast that some things are going to not be able to to take into account? And so yeah. there it's, it's an old, old it's a great question. It's an old one that in philosophy, you know, gets dealt with over and over and over again by lots of different philosophers. My favorite take on it is Hume, and he's one of my favorite philosophers, or Wollstonecraft. Both of them, I think, are my favorite philosophers together. But Hume in particular said, the absence of certainty is paralysis. So you can't go around saying, I don't know how this door handle works, because you've never seen that door. It's an empiricist, right? I've never seen this door handle before. It is the only one I've seen of this kind because it's unique. Can I open the door? Well, the answer is yes, you can open the door because you have a certainty, 90% certainty that the door will open the way it's always opened before. And if it fails, then you try again until you get more knowledge and then you can open the door. So he very clearly in the 1700s and Wollstonecraft as well is telling us, uh, Wollstonecraft even more importantly is telling us women can be as equal to men. You know, in the 1770s, she's saying women are equal or 1790s rather, is she saying women are equal to men, blacks are equal to whites because we can foresee the future, right? She can foresee the future and that's the opposite. Let me put it this way. Mark Zuckerberg, as CEO of Facebook, is like a drunk driver who gets pulled over after running over pedestrians and says, officer, I was just failing faster. Like, you have to at some point say, failing faster is a privilege, which doesn't absolve you of the responsibility of your failures that cause harm. So don't get mixed up into thinking, just because I can fail faster, I don't have to deal with the harm, the responsibility of the damage I've done. And so when you look at a humor of Wollstonecraft, they're saying, look, you can move forward without certainty. Of course, there's going to be uncertainty, but don't do harm. Move forward into uncertain areas where you're doing right and good, right? So liberate women, give them emancipation or give them, you know, suffrage, let them vote, uh, uh, you know, end slavery now. There's an uncertainty ahead, but we're moving into it because we know the difference from right and wrong. That's very different from I'm moving forward and doing damage regardless of the outcome because I'm going to get rich and other people are going to suffer. That's the worst. That's the kind of improvisation we saw in Nazi, Nazi Germany, which is literally the opposite of law and order. That's one of the great you know, takes. The historians of Nazi Germany who were Nazis at the time, who lived in political scientists who afterwards wrote about the system, said it was a state of permanent improvisation. And that is what Zuckerberg is asking for. And that state of permanent improvisation is meant to deny the rule of law, which would prevent harms against people who need protection. So you can't just use the words, you know, without meaning and throw them around, fail faster. And I'm a fan of saying fail faster within a context of I get on the race course, I get my race car, I put the hay bales up, I fail faster in this environment because it's safe and no one gets hurt and I learn. But you take that race car out and put it on the street and start doing it illegally and you just kill people. So where do you fail faster? What are you thinking of when you're saying I'm going to fail? What are the consequences of your actions? What are the rights for wrongs? That's the kind of mistakes that are being made. And Zuckerberg, for whatever reason, is able to just bypass. Like I said, some people are useful criminals and I don't know who's finding his crimes useful, but someone obviously thinks he should continue being a criminal and doing criminal activities with his platform. 
because that's what I see. When they talk about the metaverse in this future, I see a platform that will allow them to do more harms, as you say. Now, let me point out also, there's a lot to be said about false information, right? In fact, false personas. So if we say things that are wrong, well, I shouldn't say wrong, but if we say things that are sarcastic, for example, they're not technically accurate, and there's a lot of room for sarcasm. If we take on a persona like a court jester, there may be a lot of point in us using a fictitious persona, the Stephen Colbert, for example. Mm. There's a lot of ways of getting communication through by taking fake personas and fake information and using it, which are actually valid. And we have to have some accountability for them in a way that allows them because they had purpose or they had useful or, or va- use for value. So as you say, if you look at the Capitol building and you saw different things, there may be artistic license to present it as you know, the lizard dome. There may be reasons to allow that. But what changes is when there's real harm. And I think one of the big misperceptions in American culture in particular is that you should be allowed to do harm, which is wrong. Just because you have freedom of voice and the ability to present things in the metaverse or whatever virtual reality world you're in, in a way that's creative and interesting and unique and different and false, does not mean you're allowed to do harm. And so is there a certainty about harm? Yes, there absolutely is. We know certain things cause harm in a very certain way. People fly the Betsy Ross flag, the 13 circle flag, because they know it causes harm. There's no question in my mind that people put that flag up because it alienates blacks. It makes blacks feel uncomfortable in the room, let alone anyone who cares about the history of America and its you know, tortured history of slavery. So if you know people are using it in that way, that's why at Nazi rallies, they fly the Betsy Ross. That's why at Trump rallies, they fly the Betsy Ross. If you know it's being used in that way, then that gets into where speech is no longer protected because it's insightful, it's hurtful, it's causing fights, it's aggravating a situation and causing violence, right? So that's being teased out by the courts, and I'm not a lawyer, but I'm saying that don't misinterpret the freedom of information with the fact that you're causing harm. And if you know you're causing harm, then something needs to be done. Incredible talking with you. There has been so much. I've been just (laughs) holding on to my chair, trying to absorb all of this as we're speaking. I really appreciate the insights that you have and the ability to convey everything that you've gathered over these years. I imagine not having Facebook since 2008 opened you up for a lot of time to read some of these incredible (laughs) authors that you (laughs) quoted. I wish I would have been on that bad wagon too. I didn't get rid of Facebook until a few years ago. Well, actually, I'm going to be totally transparent. I still have it. I just don't use it because of of many of these things that we've talked about now. It locks you out to some things. And I don't want to have that. If I ever do want to get on something and it's owned by Facebook, I still want to be able to get onto it. And it's, of course, I I, I know. Well, I see that as like smoking. Smoking used to give you social entry. Smoking a cigarette. You think about it. I couldn't be in a certain crowd. I couldn't be in certain bars without smoking because it gave me the entry I needed in order to be in that mindset or that place to be a member of the community. And social entry is a big part of criminal behavior, right? And so people do very terrible things to themselves and others just so they can get social entry. That's what I'm thinking when people say, like, I need Facebook to do something. It's like this entry into things when they become part of the problem. The fact that you're smoking in order to get into a thing leads to other people smoking, everyone's smoking. Now you have smoke damage, including people who are serving you drinks. They're now suffering from cancer because they were trying to serve people who just wanted to be in this group that was smoking. Facebook is like that. It has a toxic element to it. By participating in it, you're basically causing harm. And I think people need to think about it in those terms. Would you stop smoking? Would you stop Facebook? So even though it gives you something, what it's giving you has harm implicit into its DNA. It is a harm platform. It is causing the type of harm that if you stop using it, you're doing a right, you're doing a good. Whereas if you continue to use it, you can't avoid doing wrong. Well, now I have to go think about that one for a while. (laughs) You should. I encourage everyone. It used to take me, I literally, I mean, around 2008, 2009, I used to go to places and talk to people about Facebook. It used to take me at least five days of hard discussion to get people around to where they'd think, you might be right about some of this. Maybe, maybe I'll get rid of my Facebook profile. I mean, it was a long slog. Twitter too, to some degree, but mainly Facebook. In the last few years, it's taken maybe five minutes at the most. And I'm seeing the same transition in Tesla too. It used to be such a hard argument that Tesla had flaws. And now it's like, I haven't run into a person lately that doesn't think Tesla's doing it wrong. 
Mm. And it's not that I see things early because I have some particular talent. It's that I just studied the things that allow you to see things early. I got a history degree. And so few people get a history degree. It makes me look weird and unique. If more people studied history, there'd be a lot more people like me. It's as simple as that. Well, I've got one last question for you before we jump off. I want to know, Davey, are you a robot? (laughs) I ask myself that all the time. And I think the answer I have is it doesn't matter. Whether I'm a robot or not, I'm doing the best I can. You know, when I think of the Philip Dick novel and the difficulty of assessing whether I'm real or not, the question is probably better phrased as, am I doing good or not? Whether a robot. So that's it. Hmm. I'm always just trying to do what I can to make things better and to stop harm. Well, thank you so much for talking with us today. This has been brilliant. Thank you.